So, the Virginia rally went off without a hitch, with no violence occurring. And that's probably why it changed nothing. Yes, this white supremacist march, which had less than 0.01% attendees verified to be white supremacists, this march of dangerous radicals where somehow nobody got hurt, and this march of evil criminals despite any significant crimes occurring, ended peacefully, and the government shut their ears the whole time. Why? Because they'd already decided no protests would change anything. And what do I mean by changing nothing? Well, the Virginia Senate just passed a red flag bill, and they're trying to essentially criminalize any further protest of a similar nature. Also, if you watch my video on Clearview, all the video evidence of the protests has essentially doxed anyone there not wearing a mask to the government. And now, they have a gun registry of you and your favorite firearms and are building a registry of who they want to forcibly disarm. So congratulations, let's get into it. For the first point, I'll read the text of the red flag law. Quote, Firearms, removal from persons posing firearms, removal from persons posing substantial risk penalties, creates a procedure by which any attorney for the Commonwealth or any law enforcement officer may apply to a general district court, circuit court, or juvenile and domestic relations district court judge or a magistrate for an emergency substantial risk order to prohibit a person who poses a substantial risk of injury to himself or others from purchasing, possessing, or transporting a firearm. If an emergency substantial risk order is issued, a judge or magistrate may issue a search warrant to remove firearms from such person. An emergency substantial risk order shall expire on the 14th day following issuance of the order. The bill requires a court hearing in the circuit court for the jurisdiction where the order was issued within 14 days from issuance of an emergency substantial risk order to determine whether a substantial risk order should be issued. Seized firearms shall be retained by a law enforcement agency for the duration of an emergency substantial risk order or a substantial risk order or for a substantial risk order and with court approval may be transferred to a third party 21 years of age or older chosen by the person from whom they were seized. The bill allows the complainant of the original warrant to file a motion for a hearing to extend the substantial risk order prior to its expiration. The court may extend the substantial risk order for a period not longer than 180 days. The bill provides that persons who are subject to a substantial risk order until such order has been dissolved by a court are guilty of a Class 1 misdemeanor for purchasing, possessing, or transporting a firearm and are disqualified from having a concealed handgun permit and may not be employed by a licensed firearm dealer. The bill also provides that a person who transfers a firearm to a person he knows has been served with a warrant or who is the subject of a substantial risk order is guilty of a Class 4 felony. The bill creates a computerized substantial risk order registry. So, how do you like that? If they get a court order, now they can seize your guns for anywhere from 2 to 12 weeks and you can't do fuck about it. Also, they won't let you carry a gun. They'll strip your permits. They'll bar your employment at a gun shop. And they'll arrest anyone who tries to give or sell you a gun. What's a substantial risk? They don't tell you. That means it's ambiguous enough to be applied wherever they fucking want, basically. They just have to find a reason to get the pigs to treat you like a wolf and not a sheep. See my vid on the war on cops for more. And they can send them to your door to threaten you with violence for having guns. And now, they know where most of your doors are. And all of what you said online. Again, see my clear view vid. It's very evident in the end of the bill that the bill creates a computerized substantial risk order registry. And y'all just helped them do that. So now the bill is here, having passed the Senate today. They have everything they need to start rounding up dissidents. 
that wasn't going to happen at the rally. Too many people there. Now they'll just come to your house or workplace or something and most people will leave them alone as they drag off your freedom. So what could be worse than that? Meet HB 1627. Quote, Threats and harassment of certain officials in property, venue, provides that certain crimes relating to threats and harassment may be prosecuted in the city of Richmond if the victim is the governor, governor-elect, lieutenant governor, lieutenant governor-elect, attorney general or attorney general-elect, a member or employee of the General Assembly, a justice of the Supreme Court of Virginia, or a judge of the Court of Appeals of Virginia. In addition, threats to damage property may be prosecuted in the city of Richmond if the property is owned by the Commonwealth and located in the Capital District. Unquote. If passed, this would make people like Northam and all his goons essentially immune to your protest. They're already trying to push a bill to effectively criminalize what happened on Monday, and now they'd be able to criminalize harassment as long as the target was someone in charge. So don't even annoy those in power. They'll lock you up. That is, if this passes. And that's not even to touch the many other threats to your gun ownership, like SB 13, which makes it a class 1 misdemeanor to have a weapon on Capitol Square, or SB 18, which raises gun owner age to 21 and demands background checks for all, or SB 22, can't buy more than one handgun a month unless you're a dealer. And then there's SB 35, quote, Control of firearms by localities, permitted events, authorizes any locality by ordinance to prohibit the possession or carrying of firearms, ammunition, or components, or any combination thereof, in one, any building or part thereof owned or used by such locality for governmental purposes, two, in any public park owned by the locality, or three, in any public street, road, alley, sidewalk, or public right-of-way, or any other place of whatever nature that is open to the public and is being used by or adjacent to a permitted event or an event that would otherwise require a permit. Provisions limiting the authority of localities and state governmental entities to bring lawsuits against certain firearms manufacturers and others will also be repealed. The bill also provides any firearm received by the locality pursuant to gun buyback program shall be destroyed by the locality unless the person surrendering such firearm requests in writing that such surrendered firearm be sold. The bill contains technical amendments. This bill incorporates SB 450, 505, 506, and 615. So let's be clear. This basically makes an ever-changing constitution-free zone in terms of gun privileges. And yeah, I'm calling them privileges. If they were unalienable rights, they wouldn't be being alienated as we speak. And this is just Virginia. Many such things happening everywhere. While our eyes are on Virginia, the state expands elsewhere and most people don't care. So this brings me to my point, and to make that point, I'll speak directly to Virginians, so send this to every Virginian you know. The state isn't in the business of shrinking. It will grow into an engulfing flame, growing more fervent with all it touches. It's a cancer, hostile and malignant to its host, and everything it touches learns to corrupt as well as it was corrupted. Even if your protest worked and the grabber legislature in Virginia completely walked away, it would be engaging in some other manner of tyranny. I mean, people accurately pointed out that some of the protesters were even breaking the law by being masked. The state doesn't like you protecting your privacy, Virginians, and they'll put you through the legal system if you try. That is, unless there are enough of you that they can't. In enough of a show of force. The only reason they didn't do it was that they wanted the protest to remain civil easy as that. So here's where you realize a basic truth. Their rules, those are just words on paper. The force mechanism is what gives them power, specifically the monopoly they have on violence. That is the essence of the state. 
the myth that they're the only ones who may legitimately behave a certain way. That ethics stop applying when you don a costume or couch your language in legalese. It's also why they can make such obvious threats to the Second and First Amendment. They know laws are just words on paper requiring the force mechanism behind them. If those who are supposed to follow the Constitution have no desire to do so, the same mechanism which holds us peons accountable will be of no use holding accountable those who run it. Accountability is fucking non-existent. And why would it be any different? Y'all have the guns for now. Y'all have enough force that they were too scared to enforce the laws in the area. You have enough guns and enough willingness to assemble with them that your state government is trying to criminalize you doing so in the name of stopping harassment and intimidation. But who are the real criminals if the alleged law of the land, which allegedly protects your rights, is so easy to burn? Who are the real criminals when the people who grant themselves an air of legitimacy under the guise of being protectors of your liberty are really threatening that same liberty and using violence, intimidation, and harassment in the name of stopping the same things? To you, is crime the violation of rights? Or is it disobedience to words on paper? If you chose the former, then realize something. The state are the real criminals. And every new law is potentially useful in expanding their criminal capability or extending the radius of their turf. The state is a gang with recognizable colors, patterns, slang, and psychology. This means that with few exceptions, when you recognize these gang members, you have a choice. Are you going to let them tread on you, or are you ready to resist? I want to tell you about a man named Lysander Spooner. When Lysander wanted to become a lawyer, he did so, even though it was illegal, without a long apprenticeship. He argued, quote, Another ground on which I would advocate a change in the law is that the present rules operate as a protective system in favor of the rich, or those who have at least a competency, against the competition of the poor. Some people have thought that a protective system in favor of the poor against the competition of the rich was a wise policy, but no one has yet ever dared advocate in direct terms so monstrous a principle that the rich ought to be protected by law from the competition of the poor, and if such a principle is to be sustained by the law of this commonwealth, it would justify an open rebellion to put down the government. When he tried to open a competing mail service to rival the states, the state shuttered his operation, but not before he got people to question the very nature of the state's monopoly on mail service. He wrote, quote, Private enterprise is always the most active physical powers and the most ingenious mental ones. It is constantly increasing its speed and simplifying and cheapening its operations, but government functionaries secure in the enjoyment of warm nests, large salaries, official honors and power and presidential smiles, all of which they are sure of so long as they are the partisans of the president, feel now quickening impulses to labor and are altogether too independent and dignified personages to move at the speed that commercial interests require. They take office to enjoy its honors and emoluments, not to get their living by the sweat of their brows. They are all too well satisfied with their own conditions to trouble their heads with plans for improving the accustomed modes of doing the business of their departments, too wise in their own estimation or too jealous of their assumed superiority to adopt the suggestions of others, too cowardly to innovate and too selfish to part with any of their power or reform the abuses on which they thrive. The consequence is, as we now see, that when a cumbrous, clumsy, expensive, and dilatory government system is once established, it is nearly impossible to modify or materially improve it. Opening the business to rivalry and free competition is the only way to get rid of the nuisance. And later, frustrated with the existence and perpetuation of state interests at the expense of people's liberty and the increasing power gap between the poor and wealthy, enabled by a state bloated by theft and corruption, he wrote a little thing called No Treason. And while you should definitely read the whole thing, here's a good part 
from the appendix of the fourth installment. Quote, Inasmuch as the Constitution was never signed nor agreed to by anybody as a contract and therefore never bound anybody and is now binding upon nobody and is moreover such a one as no people can ever hereafter be expected to consent to except as they may be forced to do so at the point of a bayonet, it is perhaps of no importance what its true legal meaning as a contract is. Nevertheless, the writer thinks it proper to say that in his opinion, the Constitution is no such instrument as it has generally been assumed to be, but that by false interpretations and naked usurpations, the government has been made in practice a very widely and almost wholly different thing from what the Constitution itself purports to authorize. He has heretofore written much and could write much more to prove that such is the truth. But whether the Constitution really be of one thing or another, this much is certain, that it has either authorized such a government as we have had, or has been powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. I think that sews it up nicely. Your Second Amendment rights are under threat, to be sure, but part of the problem exists therein. You think their Second Amendment rights, they aren't. It's a human right to defend oneself with the best means appropriate, and if there's a group with great means of mass destruction attempting to usurp your freedom and make a slave of you, it is just that you destroy your chains and your slave masters, is it not? If men with the force of history's largest, most powerful military are telling you it is unethical for you to bear arms, you must ask why and further are compelled to question the nature of their machine. How is an institution whose motto is Six Semper Tyrannis so close to tyranny itself? The answer is obvious. They see themselves as a greater caste of people. Much like David Grossman, they see you as passive, non-violent sheep, lower on the hierarchy than they, the sheep dogs and wolves, and intended to be watched and controlled at peril of being devoured. You need to recognize this illusion in order to break free from it. The first step is knowing you're being lied to. They want you to believe that they're on the same level as you, that they're just humble servants. But much like the Fabian socialists with their idolatry of the symbols of wolves in sheep's clothing, not only are authentic sheepdogs few and far between, but they are indistinguishable from the wolves. And ultimately, there are no sheep, sheepdogs, and wolves, there are only humans, presuming superhuman status and looking down upon those who would stiffly remind them of their mortality with disgust as the subhumans they presume you to be. Your gun is a symbol, a clear statement that you're not of a different class than they are. And ultimately, every law is a lifted gun. They can order you to obey, but what if you resist? They will beat chemically, sonically, electrically, or otherwise assault you, sick dogs on you, kidnap you, and cage you. If you resist this, you risk death. Hell, with the level cops are trained in escalation, and the level of corruption behind the thin blue line, they might just jump to the finish and maybe plant a gun on you to justify the killing. Because remember, it's okay for them to be armed, but if you try it, it's worth your life. I know this is all a lot to consider, especially if you're used to thinking of the state as noble. But just consider it. All I'm asking. Well, that and like, share, and subscribe, and send this to every Virginian you know, and, and consider supporting my content if you appreciate it. But other than that, just think. If it's okay when they do it, why can't you do it too? And why do they bear arms which they want to strip from you? almost like they think they're superior, almost like they're in the business of ignoring your humanity and treating you as less, almost like it's time to resist? Or are we past the point of almost now? That, I'm afraid, is a choice only you can make. Choose wisely.